Hey guys, Jasker here. Another episode of Guns I Know, episode 12. I know I haven't done one of these in a while, but I'm going to get back on the bandwagon. I got a, a bunch of gun stuff that I want to show you guys, both in this video and in a few future videos. I've actually been doing a lot of footage in terms of recording and things like that. Just I haven't gotten around to do anything with it because I've been so busy with work and with the Battlefield Esports stuff. But enough about all that stuff. Let's talk about the gun stuff instead. I have some really interesting content for this particular episode. Uh, little updates on what I've been doing gun-wise last few months. I've still been doing some shooting. Uh, I got a new pair of handguards for my SIG 553 clone. You can check it out here. I think it's pretty cool looking. It has that sort of old school SIG 552, 553 design. And it was a lot of fun to install too. Uh, again, cosmetic stuff. Uh, not as much rails on this one, but that's all right. I got a few different AK parts and things like that that I've been buying uh, for the last few months as well. I'm not going to show any of them because I think they're actually kind of, um, they're a bit, I don't think a lot of people appreciate what they are until I actually assemble them into a complete gun. Nevertheless though, I do have a, a lot of interesting uh, stuff to show you guys in this episode as well as some coming videos as well. Uh, but let's go right into the first thing. I had the opportunity to try a very special, unique, and actually incredibly rare assault rifle. Uh, that a friend of mine was working on just a few months ago. And so without telling you yet what it is, I want you guys to check this out. Many of you may know about the STG-44 Sturmgewehr 44 used by the Germans War II, but do you know about its predecessor, its prototype, the MKB-42H? Well, I got a unique opportunity to try one out, and here's one with a comparison to an STG-44. The MKB-42H was the first real prototype assault rifle that fielded any kind of substantial production. Only about 10,000 or so were made total, and there are only a few hundred in the United States as well. In this case, this one is actually a papered, full-auto, registered, fully transferable MKB-42H. It looks very similar to the STG-44, but there are quite a few big differences. But before I go into the differences, uh, let's check out some footage of uh, a friend of mine shooting this gun. Ah, you weren't aiming low enough. Oh. I'm holding under the gong. Got it. The MKB-42H has really one big difference between the, it and the STG-44. It's a open bolt gun. It means that the gun fires from the open bolt position, just like a submachine gun does. And in this respect, what's different about this compared to the STG-44 is that you can actually lock back the bolt, as I just uh, showed. What you can also do is it has a number of extra safeties as well. It has not only the, the bolt hold back open uh, uh, sheet metal, but it also has two different holes that you can actually push the bolt into and actually have an additional safety. And the reason why they wanted to have this place is that if you want to be able to uh, to operate the gun in an open bolt position, ready to fire position, uh, you can easily pull that, that bolt back in order for it to, uh, to be engaged. If you drop your gun and the bolt's open, it could slam fire because the, the sear uh, disconnects and it'd be a real problem. Uh, it also has a, a, a safety when it's closed as well, as I just showed. Uh, this gun is really quite impressive because it it's a little heavier than SG44, but boy, it's fun to shoot. And actually, here's a video of me shooting it. And I will tell you there's a slim chance that I'll be able to shoot one of these things ever again. Uh, this one probably is worth upwards of $60,000. Not even kidding. Now, I'm not an expert on MKB-42Hs, but uh, it was still a lot of fun to shoot. A real piece of history seeing a prototype of an actual SDG-44 was pretty sweet. 
That MKB-42H was a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, the STG-44, the Sturm Gewehr rifle, is such an interesting gun because it really takes all the elements of a, of a machine pistol and intermediate caliber cartridge, which back then in the 1940s was a relatively new phenomenon and married them together to create a truly different kind of rifle. I'll be doing some uh, more STG-44 videos in the future for Company Heroes 2. Uh, I don't know when that's going to come out, but I am working on it slowly but surely. Uh, I know some of you are like, well, wait a minute, Company Heroes 2 is an RTS game, not a first shooter game. How do you do comparisons? Uh, you may like it, you may not, but, uh, but stay tuned for that uh, in the uh, coming duration. Uh, nevertheless, though, let's talk about something a little more practical. Uh, as you guys know, I have a lot of military surplus guns. I have a lot of parts guns that are assembled into uh, 922R compliant non-sporting rifles here in the United States. But as you buy parts from different suppliers or buy new production U.S. made parts to be compliant with the guns that you're making, you run into some issues in terms of, uh, of the fire control group being always a bit rough around the edges. I mean, the bolt is rough around the edges. And so I would uh, show you guys uh, one methodology of many methods that you can use to clean up uh, your fire control groups to get a much more crisper, cleaner trigger pull uh, on your AKs and other uh, AK-derived platforms. And take in mind, this applies not just to AKs, this applies to nearly any kind of gun that has a pretty basic fire control group with a, a hammer and a trigger and a disconnector. Uh, so uh, check this out. Let's talk about honing a trigger or simply making a trigger smoother to fire. I'm using a Galil SAR for the test case here. We need a few tools. We need a Sharpie. And you'll see in a bit why we need a Sharpie. We need uh, two files. We have a small file and a larger file. The smaller file has a, a bit um, finer uh, grit to it. We're also going to need a Dremel tool as well as a few bits from the Dremel tool. And also we're going to need a brass punch as well to remove everything. And let's go ahead and remove all the components. Field strip this Galil. Here we go. And I'm doing it real fast. Let's look though at the Galil components. So here's what we have for the Galil components. We have the hammer, the hammer which is connected to the trigger. It has two hooks as well as a sear, and the sear is right, right there. It's actually a disconnector, not a sear, excuse me. But in order to hone a trigger or to make it smoother, we need to uh, remove as much friction as we can from these points in which the, uh, the trigger operates. And so as I release this, you'll notice that the two hooks let go of the hammer. The hammer is on a spring. And so uh, as you can see, these are the areas in which when the trigger uh, or when the hammer goes back that it actually uh, makes contact with uh, these hooks as well as the disconnector, which also makes contact as well. Now, the disconnector is in place because uh, if I simply hold the trigger down, the disconnector needs to make sure that it doesn't go into full auto fire. And so uh, I want to be able to make all these contact points as smooth as possible. And I can do this through a variety of ways. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, one way of doing it. There's one way of doing it. But again, the idea is that I want to identify the areas where the contact points are. And from there, uh, try to uh, smooth them out. I can, I'm going to file them. I'm going to buff them. I can add compound to it. Uh, you can use uh, what I use here. Or you can use lapping compound, which is something that I also use, although not in this video. And so let's go ahead and begin the, uh, again, looking at where we need to remove some things. We need to remove the, the shepherd's hook, and I'm going to make this go faster. I'm using one of those, uh, those brake pad remover hooks that you find at uh, Harbor Freight, and removing everything very quickly, speed it up, putting the springs and the hammer so it's easier to remove, taking everything out. And as you can see, it can be easily removed once you get everything unhooked, uh, removing all that spring tension. And as I slowly pull everything apart, we see all the various components. The three components we're working on are the trigger, the hammer, and the disconnector. This is a disconnector. Again, we need to identify where uh, the uh, contact points are. As you can see, it's a US made uh, disconnector. And the two main points of the disconnector are sort of beneath the hook, as well as on the head of the, of the hook as well. Uh, we really don't need to worry about the other areas, although if you're getting trigger slap issues on AKs, you can also uh, take some material off the bottom. 
This is the hammer. Hammer here, uh, again, we have two main contact point areas, uh, the back side and front side of uh, those hooks. We're going to try to smooth them out so that when the action goes backwards and goes forward, it'll, it'll be a smooth apply. And then finally, we have the trigger. The trigger, again, has two main point contact areas beneath the hook and above the hook. On it, in this case, it's a double hook trigger, so we need to be able to hit both sides, although we don't want a situation where one side is actually bigger than the other or else it'll actually uh, lean more towards one side or the other and it won't be a smooth, consistent pull backwards. Now, I'm now using a little buffing wheel, a uh, wire wheel, and I'm using a wire wheel here just to clean it up a bit. And I'm doing this because I want to be able to mark all of these areas with the blue Sharpie. I'm going to mark these areas because I want to know exactly where the contact points are going to be facing. I don't want to remove material of areas that really don't need it. And so, I, as you can see, I'm, I'm making it blue everywhere, and we're going to reinstall it. We're going to reinstall it so that we uh, can, again, identify these areas in which there are uh, the, the contact points are. And here we go. Speed it up real fast. Do, 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 do. And as we reinstall this, we will then get to see the moment of truth where we, uh, as after everything gets reinstalled, we can then begin to operate the action with the bolt carrier inside for milled AKs. It's really important to be able to do this because if you don't have that, that bolt carrier in there, you could do some damage to your receiver when that hammer slams down under all that spring pressure. So I'm going to fire. Here we go. And... We're going to do it a bunch of times. And as you can see, there's a lot of pressure, so I'm going to just move it around a bit. Eventually, I'm going to just need to reset the, uh, the hammer manually. No, I, I got it th this time. But without that spring in place, it's a lot harder to operate. Uh, and so we're going to keep on doing it again. And we're doing this because as we do this, the Sharpie ink is going to slowly wear off. And as we zoom in, you can see it's already starting to wear off on all the various uh, points in which we thought that they would wear off. These points in which the ink has worn off are areas that we need to uh, hit hard or hit, not hard, but be able to really smooth out uh, in this process. So now let's go ahead and get to the process itself. Now I'm filing these, uh, uh, this contact point on the hammer a bit. I'm smoothing it out because I don't think that it's 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 that smooth. Now you'll notice I'm put, making a lot of material taken off of this, but again, I'm just sort of smoothing it out because as I looked at it, uh, I think that it does need to get a bit more material than usual. Every AK hammer is a little bit different um, depending on the origin of country. And as such, this hammer I believe that I'm using right now is a U.S. made hammer for AKs, not for Galils. And so I compared it with some of the Galil hammers that I have and uh, decided we need to take a little bit off. But filing is really not enough. We're going to put it on a, a set of, of grips and we're going to Again, do some more filing, smooth it out as best we can. And once we do that, I'm then going to uh, use the Dremel tool uh, to further file it down to get a, a much finer consistency on it. And uh, from there, use the wire wheel. Now we're going to repeat this same process for all the ports, all the control surfaces, and then we're going to reinstall it and then give it a try. As we do, I feel like this trigger is getting much smoother, and as I pull that trigger, it's a very smooth, consistent action. It's a crisp trigger pull. Now, you can use lapping compound, and that can give you some additional uh, smoothness to it. Guys that do highly accurate long-range shooting will always use lapping compound over this these sort of blunt methods that I just showed you guys. Uh, I don't have any video of lapping compound, but I do use it on occasion, and it is worth doing as well. You may go through this process several times over. You may not like the end result through one pass of doing this, and as such, you may need to do it again. It becomes time intensive, not going to lie. But you'll find that these crew triggers that you may have, especially with these old uh, Soviet-era weapons, feel a whole lot nicer with a little bit of TLC. I hope you found that guide very helpful. Uh, I know that I had a lot of fun working on those kind of things. For some people, it's not maybe that fun to work on this, but I do enjoy doing some very basic gunsmithing while watching a movie or TV show because a lot of it's a very monotonous process. You work on it a little bit, you test it out, you, you fit check it, and you do it again. Uh, there is something very relaxing about that, uh, much in the same way that some people get a lot of enjoyment out of reloading their own ammunition. 
Uh, it's a monotonous process, but you there's a certain amount of, uh, of skill to it in the sense of understanding all the various elements and variables and being able to, uh, to create an end product that is actually pretty amazing. Uh, nevertheless, though, I I'm not going to be doing um, a, a, qu a question and answer session for this episode. I want to wait for it until the next episode because I have a question for you guys. And what I'm about to do may completely backfire on me. But I'm gonna, I've, I've really been thinking about this and I think that it, it's, a, it's a fun idea. I haven't bought a new gun. I bought a lot of ammo and parts and things like that for a while. But I haven't bought a new gun in probably, I don't know, almost two years. Um, that SIG 553 I bought was the last gun that I bought, and I bought it, uh, well, it's been two years, it's been about 18 months, about 19 months around. I haven't bought a gun in a while, though I've thought about buying it, but with uh, the uh, recent escalation in gun prices and ammo prices, I've sort of been putting it off, but they're actually all subsiding slowly. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I have a few ideas of what I would like to buy uh, as a gun, uh, but uh, in terms of the next you know, thing for my collection, uh, because I have a bunch of stuff, and this is all for collecting purposes at this point. But I, I wanted to ask you guys, what gun should I buy next? And I want to sort of make it battlefield themed. Uh, and so I'm going to give a list of choices. And I'm going to read them out, but they're also going to be listed here below. So here we go. So what gun should I buy? Some of these are BF3 only guns. Some of them uh, have been confirmed in BF4. Some have been com confirmed in Battlefield 4, but here we go. And this is, this is I'm, gonna, I'm sort of gonna be boil the ocean approach here. It can be a rifle, a pistol, or a shotgun. It cannot be a machine gun. Uh, and it, it can be a short build rifle, but um, I have to be able to convert it myself or be able to go through a Form 1 uh, or a Form 4 without going through a lot of expense along with it. Um, so let's, or it can be a pistol that I convert to a, to a, a short build rifle. But, you know, pistols, shotguns, rifles, short build rifles, short build pistols, whatever it is, or with, with a, a shoulder, but no machine guns. Uh, I am down for suppressors, though, we can do that as well. So here's the list. Here we go. Uh, the first one's a G53, which is an HK53. Uh, it, it can be an, a true HK gun, or it can be a clone. There's a whole bunch of ones out there. Sentry uh, sells them. Uh, an ACWR, also known as a, as a Remington ACR. Um, a SCAR H or a SCAR L. Uh, one's in 308, one's in 223. Uh, an MP5K, also known as the M5K in Battlefield 3. Uh, the new uh, RFB, it's a Caltech RFB, which is one of the designated marksman rifles within Battlefield 4. Uh, M39 EMR, also known as a uh, M21 or an M14, it's uh, the Springfield M14. It's the 308 caliber uh, designated marksman rifle. Uh, the UTS-15, which is that new 12-gauge um, shotgun that has dual mag tubes on, on each end of the side of the gun. It's made in Turkey. Uh, that came out, and it's out there. Um, what else is there? Spaz-12, which is always an old-school favorite, although... Uh, the Italians have made SPAS 12s in probably over 15 years now, but they're still prevalent in the used market. Uh, a Hawk 12. Now, the Hawk 12 in Battlefield 4 is supposed to be a Chinese shotgun, but there are a number of companies, uh, be it uh, Knox Armaments, who makes the Mossberg 500 with a box magazine. I know CNS Metalworks uh, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from, uh, also for a short time in the early 90s made box fed. Uh, box mag fed short barreled 870 Remington 870 shotguns. So those are always an option. Uh, CZ75, which is a pistol, it's a Czech made pistol. Uh, they actually import them to Kansas City. Uh, FN57, which is uh, the uh, the pistol that that, has, that shoots the 5.7 millimeter armor piercing rounds. It's really not armor piercing per se. Uh, they they just have uh, ballistic characteristics more similar to a intermediate caliber uh, rifle cartridge more so than a pistol but they're not armor piercing, at least not the ammunition that you can buy um, uh, legally, that is, to civilians. Uh, the MP14 Rex, MP14 Rex itself, I don't think I can actually get because it's a Russian made uh, pistol and I don't believe they're importable. However, there are a lot of 357 Magnums that are importable and I actually, uh, I have access to a 357 Magnum, my old, one of my old parents ones, so but I don't have uh, it with me anymore. So it's kind of off the bat, so maybe 357 Magnum, I mean, uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, 44 Magnum can do that as well. Uh, the P226, which is a SIG gun. And follow the HK45 or the USP, which is sort of a uh, mainstay within 
uh, the pistols of games, of, of first-person shooter games out there. Uh, I'd also add to the list the Tavor, which is the MTAR 21, which is in Battlefield 3 as well. That is out as well in, um, uh, in the United States. There's one more that I, I didn't add on this list. I want to say it's the... It's the new engineering class gun. It's the MX-4, I think. It's actually, it looks like a, um, I'm blanking now. It looks like one of those uh, Beretta 9mm carbines. I forget what they're called now at the top of my head. Um, but nevertheless, that's another option as well. They take, they take uh, the same type of magazines as the Beretta uh, 92 FSs or the Beretta M9s, which is one of the guns I deal on. So it'd be kind of cool to use the same you know, magazines in a, in a carbine that shoots 9mm. Nevertheless, though, let me know what you think I should buy, and don't, please do not uh, suggest a gun that I did not list, because almost all the guns that I listed there, with very few exceptions, um, well, let me rephrase that, all the guns I listed I can get in one respect or another. There's a number of guns that I didn't list that I can't get. Most of them I can't. There are just a small minority of guns that I, I, I can get, but I'm not going to get. So as an example, uh, I didn't say the UMP-45 or, the, or that Barrett 50 cal that's in Battlefield 4 as a pickup item. Both those are available. Both those are very expensive. Same thing with the G36s, same thing with um, some of the belt-fed machine guns. You can buy some of the automatic PKPs. But I think the last time I saw them go for, they were like six, seven thousand dollars. You can buy an AK-5C, which is a uh, an FNFNC. Um, they only go for around three or four thousand dollars. But I'm not going to spend four thousand dollars on a whim. Although I'll tell you, FNFNCs are the cheap, one of the cheapest machine guns you can buy legally in the United States. Uh, with an auto sear, they're around four or five thousand dollars. The only thing cheaper than an FNFNC is really those Mac 10s, Mac 11s um, that are you know, the uh, you guys know I'm talking about the Mac 10s. They're, they're, a lot of the rappers lack them. Um, not that I, I listen to a lot of rap music, but that's what they're known for. Uh, like, with, like with the Tech 9, same concept. Uh, but Evan FNC is pretty cool. Uh, Al Pacino used it in, uh, in Heat, and that was a good, great movie. Uh, I actually, not to go too much on a tangent, but for a while, I wanted to collect every gun uh, in the movie Heat uh, because it's such a great movie. It's one of those sort of... Uh, uh, movies where if you're a gun person you really appreciate because they do a really good job at showcasing uh, at least a, a greater amount of authenticity when it comes to the guns, the how you use them, the limitations, things like that. There's a scene in there in which, not to spoil the movie, Val Kilmer is firing at a, an enemy. I'm not going to say the situation, but you Google, if you Google Val Kilmer uh, heat on, on, on YouTube You'll see, you'll see the scene I'm talking about. But he's firing his, his M16. I believe it's one of those Colt commandos from the, from the 1990s that were really esoteric back in the day. And he, he does a speed reload that is really quite incredible. And there's stories about how, I'm gonna butcher this, so guys that are in the Marine Corps, please help me out. I've heard stories that the Marine Corps uh, drill, drill sergeants will often say, uh, if you can't reload as fast as this actor can in the movie Heat, then you need to keep on practicing. It's a really funny anecdote. Um, don't know how true it is, but I like to think that it's true. But it's a, a great scene, great movie. Uh, I, I haven't. I, I kind of you know, dropped off after I got real close because I got. I'm going. I know I'm ranting here, but just you know, whatever. All right, I was about to go on another tangent, but the camera battery died, so I guess that means that I'm gonna get cut off. Nevertheless, thanks for tuning in. Send in your questions, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. I'll see you guys later.